Um, I just wanted to say a word or two about the series that we're doing. Um, we intend to try to do readings uh, with our uh, local authors uh, that we have their books in the gift shop at Artworks, um, you know, at least once a month um, and, that, and tie those as we can to the exhibits that we have in the gallery. Um, Artworks is, uh, our mission is to vitalize the community through the arts and humanities. And um, we try to do that that through, you know, a variety of collaborations that we do, um, you know, through the gallery and the gift shop and classes and programs. And so we're really pleased. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is kind of fill the void that was left when our local bookshop uh, closed um, a year ago. And so we are trying to, you know, host local authors and then also have book signings and uh, carry their books and do readings. So, um, you know, I hope you'll keep track of these things because we have a lot of, we have a lot of wonderful local authors and um, we're pleased to be able to, you know, present their work. And so tonight we have three authors, uh, all of their works are in the gift shop. And uh, I'll introduce all three at first here because then what we're hoping is that uh, after we get going and they begin reading and talking with each other that I just totally disappear and there's no <laughs> and there's no more moderation from me. Um, uh, our first author will be DeWitt Clinton, who is the author of the Conquistador Dog Text and the Coyote Inca Text uh, from New Rivers, Ta Ta uh, New Rivers Press. And at the end of the war uh, from Kelsey Books, his poems and essays have appeared in national and international journals. And some of his uh, works have actually been choreographed by the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee Dance Department. Um, and so, and, and we're uh, familiar with Dee because Dee is a longtime friend of ours. He was with John in the workshop in uh, Bowling Green many, many moons ago. And uh, it was really a wonderful, a wonderful influence and uh, a good mentor for us. Um, Second, our other author will be uh, Deirdre uh, Fagan. And Deirdre uh, is a, a widow, a wife and a mother of two who writes poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction and essays on literary criticism and pedagogy. Uh, she's a native of New Yorker who has pre previously lived in Arizona, Florida, Illinois and Maryland. She currently resides in Michigan where she is associate professor and coordinator of creative writing at English. Literature and World Languages Department at Ferris. She coordinates the Literature in Person series, which uh, brings national and regional authors to Ferris and facilitates National Poetry Month events. Um, and Deirdre is uh, just a, 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 a wonderful influence with our students at Ferris and has just done amazing things in terms of uh, creating an interest in writing and fostering young writers. And then our third writer is John Cullen, who I really just don't know that much about. Mm -hmm. um, he, he gave me his bio. He says he's from SUNY Geneseo and Bowling Green State University and has been teaching at Ferris since the beginning of time, which I think might be true. Uh, his recent poems were in Harper Plate, the McGuffin, North Dakota Quarterly, Stone Hamilton Review. And, way on the back and back. he'll be reading a little- Symbol of a microphone. Pardon? She can hear you, honey. Oh, okay. And uh, his book, Tom Crazy, published by Slipstream Press, is available at The Painted Turtle. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to John, who's going to start with a, uh, a, a couple selections, and then we're going to you know, go back and forth between all three writers this evening. Hi, thanks for showing up. If I could get the uh, dog out of here, I can... Say something. I thought I'd start with just one or two out of the chapbook that's available in the Painted Turtle gift shop. Um, the poems in this collection are pretty much poems about people and places. And so they're really not much at all about me. And I think in some ways that was kind of a healthy thing um, to kind of get away from the eye. Um, but I thought I'd start with one called Annie Jilson. One December afternoon, she simply left her life behind, her footprints marching straight through snow and disappearing down the road. The state police arrived hours later, 
following a tip from an unknown caller who claimed he'd found her door ajar and then hung up before dispatch could ask his name. After knocks and shouts outside each window, they wiped their feet and stepped inside. But all they found were dishes washed and stacked, a herald squared on the coffee table, and a green rubber band binding quarter wrappers from the long defunct West Trust. Unable to think what else to do, they radioed into the local sheriff, who later failed to check the attic's trunks when he searched the house for clues. Lakeline Power told the Herald Times Press they'd keep her porch lights bright one month, and knots of girls in Cali High School hallways whispered where she'd gone and why she left, and who the lover was who must have done her wrong. For several weeks, a neighbor fed her howling shepherd, then paused a moment, lost in thought, and lying in beds as if they were alone, authorities who patrolled the Lakeshore counties dreamed of her on windy nights, but her face remained a mystery. Six months later, mutual trust dissolved her house and stopped the boys who walked her porch on dares. Now she's a legend with past she couldn't have remembered and a future so certain if she returned tomorrow, she'd have to walk again. And then another short one from the collection and now maybe throw it to D and see if he has any poems about places or people that might or might not fit in. This one's just called Michigan Signs. The sign reads antiques, glass and bait Behind the shelf, a pair of flintlocks crosses a black and white photo of a bearded hunter with 10 dead wolves stretched neatly in the snow. The shadows at his feet could be a lack of sun or blood. Gouged dead center by a rifle slug, a steel plate leans against a weathered mallard, the caliber penciled on an index card, duct taped firmly to the decoy's neck. A beginner at best, I clutch my bucket then ask the girl to net a dozen specks. She marks her Bible with a greasy feather, then coils her hair behind her neck while her other hand dips, netting silver fish. She rings me up on a brand new NCR, and when I try to make my change exact, she points to an ashtray filled with pennies and a sign that tells me to take what change I need. Then wishing me luck, the biggest in the lake, she turns to traps and a battered red Schwinn, a canvas belt for ammo and a stack of Reader's Digest and sinks her teeth in the flesh of an apple. I don't know, I, I you know, I, I kind of grew up liking lyric poetry, but I also sometimes found that being too much I in the poem was maybe distracting to people and it might be better to get away from that. And that's one of the things that working on poems about places did for me. Oh, D. Hello there. Well, a lot like John and uh, Place. Uh, my first two books were Conquistador narratives, long, long poems. Some of them were 30, 40 pages. And the lines were extremely long. The publisher had to find a special way of designing the book. Um, Sorry, I came off camera. My camera crew isn't very experienced with this, but the pages are quite like that. I was convinced I would be writing conquistador narrative poetry for, for the rest of my life. And then the publisher said, well, let's, we're gonna publish other people. <laughs> and so all of a sudden I uh, had to uh, sort of redesign what I was doing I've been writing a lot of poems about place lately, and I wanted to tell you what I've been doing in the last few years. I had a sabbatical just before I uh, retired from UW Whitewater. I'm, I'm broadcasting from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I had the, the delight of reading all of the collections I could find in print of titles with 100 poems by or 100 poems from. 
And then I found a, I was reading about 30 or 40 of those. And then I found the Chinese collections and they were most likely always a hundred poems of something, of one era or another. And then I found this book, 100 Poems from the Chinese, translated by Kenneth Wexroth. And I had never found a more surprising uh, and delightful book of poems. And I had just finished writing for about a decade, Holocaust and genocide poems and teaching in that area as well. So I began writing, I'm sorry, I began reading this collection and they were so inspirational that I began taking some notes. And over time, over about a year and a half, those notes became uh, this book by a lake near a moon fishing with the Chinese masters. I know no Chinese. I can't even pronounce Chinese. I'm very interested in it. Um, I spent time in Asia, in South Vietnam, but I don't think that qualifies for anything. There you go. No. This is a poem uh, by Uyang Hu, an answer to Ting Wan Xin. This is his 57th poem. By the way, Kenneth Rexroth didn't translate these poems by himself. He had a team and the team put together the sort of the core uh, words that were part of this. It's remarkable how this collection reads like 1970s American poetry. So free, so simple. The spring wind will never reach me this, on this frontier. It is the second month and there are no flowers in the town or on the hills. Destructive snow breaks the branches where oranges should hang. Freezing wind and thunder drive the bamboo shoots back into the earth. All night you can hear the sad cries of the wild geese. They make me think of my old home. I have been sick since the new year. The sight of flowers might cheer me up. I am no longer your guest. Among the flowers at Luoyang, but even the wildflowers, if they would only come, would be enough to make me happier. Well, how did I write these poems from these poems? So one guide was to use the same number of lines as the classical Chinese poets did. Another guide was to write with the same number of syllables and the same number of lines. That was a little bit of a structure for me and I, and I appreciated that. Here is a response. Walking by the river, I wonder what the question was in Ouyang Hu's an answer to Ting Hua Xin. So in many ways, these are response poems an entire book of poems of mine based on an entire book of poems of Kenneth Rexworth. We're threatened with snow flurries by the end of the night. The ground almost green can barely push the first locuses and hyacinths up from our brown white winter. Further south, the strawberries and oranges are, are nearly ruined by late freezes. Somewhere the first spring winds will drop down and deliver cold boiled ice the neighbors keep the wolfhound out all night long. We won't even dream of sleep. The two of us wink in between the barks. Tomorrow, since it's spring, we'll buy some cut spring flowers just in case you just might think of dropping by. If we could do anything, we'd probably have the robins in just to bring the spring inside. So, with each poem, I was inspired either by a phrase or by some imagery or by how the poem was shaped. Uh, so it was, a, it was a very pleasurable experience to read from uh, a completely different tradition. These classical Chinese poets, which Kenneth Rexroth translated, were from about the 8th century to about the 13th century. Mine are all of the last few years. And I'll read the rest of mine. On a mid-April after, mid afternoon near the banks of the Milwaukee River, I read 
Su Dung Bo's The Red Cliff. Sadly, it's not the Potomac, so we don't expect to see our president float by. We do fish out the dead who've dropped their lives from our higher jumping bridges. Of course, the other side is all Wisconsin, then a river too wide to walk across, then stinky hogs and waving corn, waving wheat, snow-capped mountains, then white wine land, just before the few can sail to old Hong Kong. For many, this is heaven, as the dead are planted all the way. Long ago, we gathered on the banks to remember the wedding of two Wiccans, complete with song and brooms and ropes wrapped around their wrists for love. Only later did we learn about the rope that wrapped around our dear dead bride, who repeated what her mother also did with rope. We heard she may be resting in the East. Why do these poet friends vanish into ash and smoke? The younger ones will laugh their heads off when they see my hairless head, but I don't care a bit. Just pour that right up to the lip while I watch one more moon rise out of what we call our muddy river. It's a little bit different than what's John, what John is writing. More narrative for John, more lyrical for me. I'm moving sort of away from narrative to lyrical. Why don't we have you read a little bit, John? John, can you hear me? Uh, let's see. John? John, you'll have to unmute. We can't hear you. There we go. There. We're I'm unmuted. I'm unmuted. Sorry about that. Well, I was thinking of throwing it over to Deirdre, if she can unmute herself. Are you there, Deirdre? I am here, and I'll turn on my video for a little bit. If I get crackly, please signal me, and I'm going to turn it off and just go with um, audio because I'm having a little bit of my rural internet issues that I, I tend to have. <laughs> Are you hearing me okay so far? Thumbs up from anyone hearing okay? All right. Um, so I was thinking about what um, John said about moving away from the eye and about his regional characters that he gives to us in town crazy. Um, and I was also thinking about um, sort of the absorption of experience through Dee's poems of, of the other poems of these Chinese authors and how he sort of um, regenerates them, he creates something new, but there's there's the I as part of the poems that he creates out of his experience with those. And I would say that as a memoirist as well, and a, a poet, a lot of my poetry does stem from the I. I write a lot with I and we and you um, in my fiction, obviously in my memoir, but also in my poetry. Um, but at the same time, I have uh, the book that I'm going to read from tonight initially is The Grief Feeder, which is a collection of fictional stories um, presenting various characters who are coping with grief in different ways. And a number of these narratives are written through the I, but it is not me, but they are told in the first person. Um, some are in third person. Um, but the opening I thought I would share since we're moving from poetry and then I can kind of volley it back maybe to John is this book also includes, it seems like all of my books are going to include some poems. So there are some poems in my memoir that's forthcoming in a, in a year and a half. And there's um, obviously I have a poetry chat book but then there's also a couple of poems included in with my fiction. I don't seem to be able to uh, write prose without including some poetry. <laughs> So the opening poem to this book is um, about characters and it is um, intended to signal to the reader that there's a variety of characters that are about to come and just kind of get the reader to think about that but through a poem. The poem is titled, The Thing Is. The thing is we are all characters, characters in a play, a play of our own making and we can change the set and the lights and the stage where makeup or not, hell, even a wig, 
We can even alter our character or play several at once. But the music, so little of that is in our control. And the audience, the one we imagine and prepare for, rarely arrives. The one in the front center is the one who came, not always the one we want. And when the tickets sell, it's often not for the right reasons, whatever they are, but most certainly the wrong, which we usually know or can at least imagine most clearly. The marquee always gets it wrong. It's salacious and we are all bones, atoms and other things not illuminated by lights. So the show goes sometimes with tap dancing and we sing. Thank you. John, do you wanna read a poem? Are you there, John? Do you wanna read or should I keep going? I'm okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, do you wanna jump in or should I? Or does, do you want to jump in or? I have a short story to read. Sure. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll do one then. Um, I was thinking that, you know, I was thinking that Dee had his book of uh, Chinese poets and uh, got some inspiration from those and set up things. Um, Unfortunately, I only have the internet. Um, and what I found is a lot of times, a lot of the poems I write kind of are sparked by oddball sort of stories and things that I read on the internet or see on the internet. And I was reading something on the internet the other day and they were talking about the old Superman show. And I, I remember that um, way back from when I was a kid in the black and white TV. And this is called Superman Through Lead. Fridays I flew home from school, faster than a speeding beagle, more powerful than any fan, to watch Superman in black and white. My favorite episode involved the Man of Steel's penetration of a lead-lined vault after Lois Lane's certainty a criminal lived inside, sipping red wine, biding time while the statute of limitations for his crimes drained through the courtroom floor. Lead the one element impervious to x-ray vision. Lead, the perfect housing to shield the underworld's heart. Lead, so molecularly dense and secret, evil believes it's gold. How would Superman overcome this hurdle and bring to light the murk that lurked inside? He pressed himself against our weakness, embraced what he hated and feared to pass through taking advantage of nature's microscopic spaces, pushing each atom of his complex structure around the elemental levels of atomic structure in order to pass through, then solidify inside the vault. Like so many episodes, this one reeks metaphor. Ever transcendental, he meditates his body until it is so diffuse, it embraces the elements in an act of selfless love. A frightening loss of self, that's a risk, Few can imagine that dissolution of the steely self into an atomic kiss for a moment of balance, risking forever separation, then once again made whole. Of course, as kids, we wondered, slack-jawed at Lois, clearly aroused by the grand ideal embodied in danger and rescue. It was more dramatic than the family shows with their boring world of paper boots and puppets and the delicate spiral of nose best pipe smoke softening the moral landscape. But what did our parents think watching that man of steel melt or Clark Kent's boss behind his desk exhorting daily the spirit of Caesar which drifts in the underworld grayness of Hades where nothing arrives but a boatload of ghosts. I suspect they thought it wasn't worth watching preferring Lawrence Welk or staggering Guggenheim. But we had friends who were hit by the bus after school and one whose head rolled right into the ditch while his body lagged behind, half in and half out the windshield. My older friend's brother lost his arm in a baler. Every day was a perilous walk as we pushed ahead 
with one cheek kissing lead, we knew most elements in the world were kryptonic. I don't know, Dee, you got any uh, superhero poems there uh, <laughs> to well, share with us? All the classical Chinese poets were super. I was also thinking about your <laughs> method and it reminded me of a type of thinking called associational. One thing leads to another and it's a little bit like um, the 1970s poets in the fact that there was kind of a leaping poetry. I think you might remember that in one of our classes in the last century, but um, it's quite enjoyable to hear uh, you go from uh, one association and that triggers another association and another. The classical Chinese poets were pretty much focused on one um, image or one mood or one temperament. Um, this is um, this is a poem from uh, Su Dong Po. And by the way, every title of the poems has the name of the classical Chinese poet and his poem. So sometimes when the when my work is very short, the title is longer than the poem. It's sort of fun. After cycling through the countryside, I slow down to read Su Dong Po's A Walk in the Country. It's been such a long time since I've walked through our tiny village where I live and walking past the buildings where I work might not be the same as a walk in the country, fewer turkey buzzards soaring, red tail hawks perching, and the red foxes do not come into our village as much as we'd like them to. But if we do walk in the country, it's after a long drive just to find the country where we could stop for greens and berries, flavored coffees and warm apple pies. But in the fall, we take the day to drive north into the holy hills, looking for autumn scenes, pumpkins, corn stalks, apple ciders, and the Horicon Marsh to sight thousands of birds who fly through. Then by dusk, we drive into the forest to find the fox and hounds, our once a year old hunting grounds for a feast of trout or salmon, missing the roast elk or venison or juicy pork loin. On this night, we drink the local wines, but not enough to get so lost in the dark on our way home to our village by the shore. The next day, we usually count gray storm clouds and sight the first snowflakes. So sometimes the Chinese poets did write a kind of a narrative lyrical, but um, a lot different from the traditional way of thinking of, of uh, telling stories. More images uh, laced together. Deirdre, would you like to join in? Sure. I love the imagery in your poem, Dee, and it just, it really captivates and carries us along. So thank you. A lot of I, it is inspired by, um, by Rexroth's poetry, which is translated back into the eighth or ninth century. There's so much weaving together there. So I, I think I'll go ahead and read one of the stories from the Grief Eater. I've selected this one partly because of its length. It's one of the shorter ones in the, in the book. Um, and I would say that all these characters are reaching in some way uh, to find someone else, a, a kind of community to help them to cope with their grief. This one is titled Rotary Dial and I, I still have a rotary dial phone. Um, if you don't know what a rotary phone is. Um, you, yeah, it's, it's one where you had, you had to turn the, the dial with your finger and then it would kind of click, click, click back. And I, I was going to bring a prop, but clearly I'm having issues that I can't have my video on, so I, I can't show you the prop. So, rotary dial. Chuck reached for the phone. He had never talked much on the phone and had never much liked it. He wasn't that sort of man. He'd been the sort of man who awoke at 4 a.m. even on weekends, dressing fully before leaving his bedroom by pulling on his worn boots with certainty and buttoning his shirt carefully with his calloused hands. 
He would then pour a plastic Casey's General Store cup of black coffee and be on the way to the farm in his Ford F-150 with the cup screwed into its base on the dash by 415. He was a man of many expressions, but few words. His eyes, black holes deep in their sockets and his mouth set tightly against the backdrop were pointed enough. A pursing of the lips and a slight squint and he said his piece while pacing a length. But this morning, Chuck reached for the phone. Ever since Ethel died, he made calls. He dialed randomly at first, willing to speak to anyone who answered the line. Sometimes he reached businesses and would engage in some sort of inquiry. What are your hours today? Is Lisa, a suitably common name, in today? I was wondering if I could make an appointment. Yes, two o'clock on Saturday is fine. I am wondering what it would cost to refinance my house. I am wondering if I could get a better deal on life insurance. Car insurance? What sorts of vehicles do you sell? Sorry, I must have the wrong number. Other times he would reach a residence. I must have misdialed. Are you sure Dave, another suitably common name, isn't there? But this is the number I have for my daughter and it can't be wrong. Are you a friend of Archie's? He told me I should call you about a problem I'm having with my radiator. Then Chuck started calling for Ethel. He asked every woman who answered the line if she was Ethel. He hung up on the men. He dialed outside his area code. No sense risking reaching someone he actually did know. Sometimes he would reach someone who would stay on the line 45 seconds or more. Other times the person would hang up without even saying that Chuck had reached the wrong number. Sometimes he was taken for a telemarketer. Once he was yelled at for calling during supper. Once he dialed a sex line. Then one Saturday before the coffee Chuck had poured had even cooled, he dialed Ursula. Hello, is Ethel there? Who? Ethel, I'm calling for Ethel. No, Ethel isn't here, just me, Ursula. Oh, sorry, Ursula, I was just trying to reach Ethel. Oh, that's okay, Ursula, Ethel, what's the difference? They sort of sound the same, don't they? Yes, I suppose they do, but I don't know. What sort of a name is Ursula anyway? I think it's Latin, I don't know. We're German, strong German stock. Ursula sounds German, doesn't it? It sounds more German than Latin. Who is Latin anymore? I mean, unless you're talking about Latinos, but that's not the same thing, is it? Chuck wondered if it was. He never knew anyone who was Latin or Latino. He didn't think. He knew Ethel and she was English and Irish. She had curly gray hair she had kept close to the head, but long enough for him to pull on her curls with affection. When they were young, her hair had been auburn and long past her shoulders. She had worn it styled, often in a braid of some sort to manage those curls, which were not in fashion then. And Chuck would reach around to tug on them gently when he hugged her or when she was doing the dishes and her back was to him or she was occupied with something or another. When Ethel got older, she stopped trying to curb her hair or Chuck's affections. And she'd also kept Chuck closer and closer by her side. After they both knew Ethel was sick, Chuck hardly left the house. He hadn't been good at helping with her hair then and it, it became wilder than it had ever been, splayed out in different directions around her pillow. But Chuck didn't mind and Ethel let it go. Chuck and Ursula talked while Ursula sipped her coffee in Arizona. Chuck lived in North Dakota. He'd never been to Arizona. It didn't much matter to him where Ursula was though. He was just happy to be talking to her. And then Ursula said she had to go. She was going to go do some garage sale hunting and the early bird gets the worm. It was nice talking to you, Chuck. I hope you find Ethel, she said and hung up. Chuck missed Ethel even more now, but he didn't know what number he had dialed to reach Ursula and that made the absence even more profound. He'd been told he should update his phone, but he didn't see anything wrong with a rotary dial. He didn't understand why everything had to be updated. Things were good as they were. Chuck began dialing randomly, trying to reach Ursula again, but he kept getting the usual responses from the people who picked up. Now he would say, Ethel, 
and then Ursula. And then when the woman said no to both, he would get an even greater sinking feeling. And then Chuck's monthly phone bill came. When he pulled it from the envelope, he realized it had all the long distance numbers he had dialed all month with the dates and times. It was easy to remember the day he'd reached Ursula and now he had her number. But now that he had it, he didn't know what he should do with it. Could he call her again? Should he? Was he being too presumptuous? He'd heard someone say that once, that certain things were presumptuous. He'd heard that at the Golden Biscuit. The waitresses were talking about how it was presumptuous to go out on a date with a man and expect him to pay for dinner. Chuck had never thought about that. He'd always paid for dinner when he and Ethel went out, even before they were married. Wasn't that what a man was supposed to do? He had also opened Ethel's car door and helped her on with her coat and pulled out her chair at the Golden Biscuit. All these things he was overhearing about new rules were confusing to him. Ethel had always thanked him for such things. The only time she swatted him away was when he tried to help her in the kitchen. She had always said that was her way of opening the door for him or pulling out his chair. He just needed to sit down and eat. He hadn't been eating much since Ethel died. Chuck didn't know if he should call Ursula or not, but he couldn't help himself. He looked in the mirror as he dressed the morning he decided he would call again. His flannel wasn't curving out in the middle like it used to. His shoulders were now sloping and his belly was not. Ursula? Yes? Hi, it's Chuck. Oh, the man from North Dakota. Did you ever find Ethel? Well, no, not exactly. But I did think that maybe we could talk a bit more. That is, if you aren't going out to the garage sales. Oh no, Chuck, I don't go to garage sales on Wednesdays. Wednesdays I quilt. Let me pour a cup of coffee. Do you like coffee, Chuck? I just love coffee. I can drink a pot a day. The doctors say you shouldn't, but I don't get that reasoning. People should worry more about all those things they stick in two liters or their noses. Coffee never did anything to hurt anyone and I drink mine black. How do you take your coffee, Chuck? Why don't you pour yourself a cup and we can sit down together and chat? I could sure use the company. Ursula began describing her quilt projects and stitches and the gals that belonged to the quilting club with her and Chuck just listened. He listened, listened more than he probably had ever listened because just the lilt of Ursula's voice soothed him. Chuck began to imagine Ursula as he leaned his head back in his easy chair. He hoped Ursula didn't have curly hair or blue eyes. He hoped she was different. He didn't want her to be like Ethel. He wanted Ethel to stay just the way she was and Ursula to be Ursula. All that he imagined was Ursula kept pouring through the phone. The talk was all. And that is what started it. A misdialed number looking for Ethel and Chuck had found Ursula. Now Chuck missed Ethel a little bit less most days and Ursula a little bit more others. When Chuck was lonesome, he dialed Ursula. It made him feel good and he began eating again. One day Ursula was going to cook a ham steak and some fried potatoes, she said. When they hung up so Ursula could cook dinner, Chuck ordered from the golden biscuit, raced to pick it up and called Ursula back. He said he hoped he wasn't interrupting but he'd like to talk over dinner and so they did. They listen to each other chew and take drinks. And in between the talking and chewing, there was laughter. One Monday afternoon, the phone startled Chuck when it rang. Chuck, it's Ursula. I hope you don't mind me calling. It feels so forward of me. I was just, I was just pouring myself a cup of coffee and I, Ursula, yes. Thank you for calling. Thanks. Thanks so much. I love that one. Um, I read the collection and I particularly like that story. Thank you. Do you, what do you like about it? What, if you can articulate it? I, I like, 
I, I like that idea of people reaching out and the language and the way the language kind of hems and paws around in the way real language does to try to make some sort of connection and between people. And I think that's what good literature tries to do, you know, use the language to make some kind of connection and observation. And it, it really just seems to me to be a story about creating Chuck's next story, I guess. It's, it's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I think, you know, I struggled with dialogue in the beginning. And so I had to, um, I had to kind of work at how I would, I would create their character through how they spoke. So thanks. If I could jump in, Deirdre. Sure. I enjoyed it immensely because it's like you're on the third party of an old phone system. And you're listening in to <laughs> people on your, on your, I forget the name of that type of phone. Where, where the you party, line. party line. Party line, yeah. I like that. Yep. Like listening in to this relationship. And uh, you didn't want to hang your, your receiver up. It was very pleasant. It's, uh, it's funny. I think this is the sweetest story probably in the collection. Some of the other ones are a little odd and um, maybe they're darker. Uh, but it's funny you should mention the party line because when I was reading yesterday, you know, practicing a bit, reading the story aloud, I was thinking about the party line and maybe mentioning that. And one of the delightful stories that I heard about Robert Frost when I visited his dairy farm, I, I did a book on Frost and I did some traveling about to his, his homes and um, his, uh, where he's buried and that sort of thing. And one of the stories told by the person at the dairy farm was that part of how Frost um, mastered the New England dialect was he had a habit his neighbors didn't much like of listening in on their phone calls <laughs> because there was a party line. <laughs> and so when it rang, he just immediately yeah. picked it up and then just didn't hang it up like you were supposed to. So I just thought that was wonderful. <laughs> and so listening to that dialect you know, allowed him to employ it in his poetry, so. Yes. Well, there's supposedly a story about James Joyce living in a boarding house at some point and excusing himself from dinner at night to go up and literally listen through the floorboards to the family at dinner to sort of catch the, the way people you know, spoke at dinner. And he claimed, or someone claimed that he had said that helped him with his uh, writing dialogue. I don't know if it's a true story, but it's a good story. Sometimes they don't have to be true if they're good. <laughs> right? That's true. That's true. That's true. I wonder if any of our, our viewers have any reactions or questions or complaints or praises of good. <laughs> If you do want to speak, you have to unmute yourself. Um, I really enjoy listening to all uh, the poems and short stories. And the other, I, I really enjoy the story so warm and it touched the, I think the tender spot um, of every one of us. Uh, I think I, I really like it. I, I just uh, wonder when you were, uh, you said that it's a short stories about how different people deal with grief. Um, so all these little stories, um, I just wonder where do you, where did you get it? Do you hear it from somewhere where you just, uh, you know, create it uh, based on pure imagination or your understanding about uh, human beings? I'm just curious. I seldom uh, wrote short stories. I write poems by myself, but short stories, stories are, are, are hard for me, I think, because Sometimes I just, uh, it's, it's just hard for me to create, you know, uh, to create a story, you know, out of nothing and uh, create the human beings. I mean, their reaction and, and make it real. Uh, that's, the, that's the part I think that needs a lot of uh, skills. So I would just want to just uh, hear about your, your experience. Well, thank you for the question. And also thank you for coming. Um, Sha, I met Sha at a conference as well. Um, and she's a lovely poet. And I, I, if we're friends on Facebook, you've probably seen me share some of her poems. Um, in response to your question, 
I, you know, I, I started this collection um, actually quite a while ago now. It was my late 30s. I, when I was 36, my father and brother died two weeks apart, and they were the last members of my birth, you know, immediate family. So I, and neither of my brothers had married, neither of them had children. I really was the last person left in my immediate family. And it was a very lonely experience. And, you know, at first I found myself in the self-help section of bookstores. And um, really, I didn't feel like there was a whole lot I was getting from those sorts of books that I didn't already know about grief, having experienced it a number of times already. So then I found myself turning to poetry um, and a nonfiction that was uh, like, I, I found myself reading in the book Stiff, which is it's the curious lives of cadavers, just dark. I could only make it partway through, and then I decided, okay, I'm not ready to read this. Um, and I really returned to, to poems by Dickinson and such, but then I found myself wanting to express some of my emotions through writing. I wasn't interested in writing about myself or my own experience at that time. So I started um, working on these fictional stories, but they were driven very much by emotions that I think are natural and human when you're grieving. The desire to connect to others who maybe are also grieving or to reach out to somebody and, and just make a connection. And so I started to imagine, and, and it was a, over a, peer, you know, a number of years that these ideas would come to me, but the dialing of a phone was, so say you're entirely alone, how do you make that connection? And isn't there a sort of safety and intimacy and calling someone you don't know, right? On the one hand, you're connecting with them. They're this voice on the line. On the other hand, you don't know them. You're not looking at them. Well, you're not looking at me right now. But you know, so there's a sort of, I don't know, freedom in it, but he wasn't alone in those moments that somebody answered the phone. Um, the grief theater, the, the title story for the collection, and I'll stop there, is somebody who actually finds herself, she doesn't really know why she's doing this, you don't know why she's doing this either, but she finds herself compulsively attending funerals in a desire to be with other people who are grieving. Um, and it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not something really acceptable in our society to show up at funerals of people you don't know. That's That would be considered a bit odd. Um, but as I thought about it, when I was creating the story, I thought, well, why is that odd? You know, wh why, why wouldn't it just be really respectful to do that? Um, but this character, you know, skirts the line because she pretends sometimes that she did know the person. So in that way, you know, it's, it's not really, um, I think it would be off-putting if somebody was pretending to have experiences they didn't have. Um, so I, I guess, you know, true emotions, but imagined experiences and often ones that, that pushed against um, the boundaries of what's acceptable when somebody is grieving. Because I think, I think we grieve in, in, you know, messy ways and, we often control how we grieve because we decide our compulsion is unacceptable. So I wanted to, since it was fiction, <laughs> I wanted to free these characters to grieve however they wanted. So I hope that helped to answer your question. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. Deirdre, there's a character in uh, the television series, Six Feet Under. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it's- I a TV series about a funeral home family. Yes. And there's one character who becomes, uh, who returns again and again, and she visits uh, funeral homes and funerals just to be uh, with other people, as you, as you mentioned. So I actually probably didn't see that episode because mm -hmm. I was, we were actually watching that show nightly at the time that my father died. Oh my. And my husband, after we lost him and then my brother, my, my husband and I decided we could not watch that show anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it was just too close to home. However, the opening line of one of the stories in my book titled He Undertook Her is, have you ever seen Six Feet Under? Oh. Um, 
Yeah. And it takes yeah. place in a funeral home with a character uh, asking the funeral home director if he's seen the show. <laughs> so it's funny. It, it seems staged that you asked me that question, Dee, because <laughs> we didn't talk about this beforehand, but it sounds like, you know, I, I passed you a note during class here and said, could you please ask me about this show? <laughs> John, do you have a poem you want to continue with? Um, well, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't, I certainly can't follow up on, on, uh, on Deirdre's wonderful story in any particular way. Um, I, I, I think I'll just end up with one short one that's on, um, uh, basically on, on cartoons and cats. I see that Olive is here and maybe she'll, she'll like this. I, I always feel sorry for cats, you know, they always get it on the <laughs> cartoons. And so I, I uh, uh, this one's just called At Home. And uh, it, it sort of takes a fictional, somewhat fictional experience of watching cartoons with, um, with my sister's kids and then sort of being distracted from what I kind of wanted to say to them by the cartoons, which are so distracting and darkly humorous, but in a kind of a bad way when you think about it. So this one says at home, I'm stuck with my sister's kids who want to watch cartoons. We spin the channels. I'm looking for Popeye muttering to himself and searching for a can of courage to save a day marked by the violence of Bluto and the jello-like legs of olive oil. But the kids demand robots crashing the Jersey shoreline, Japanese samurai teens in pink sneakers slicing black-robed ninjas into sushi. We compromise on Warner Brothers and laugh at Sylvester, who trips into a giant egg slicer, then steps free. Six thin slabs wobble and collapse. <laughs> Suddenly, I remember the snap of bone, the bird's nest unwoven by an errant gust of wind, and how the small things always fall apart. Dismemberment, reality's ritual. Reattachment, always a question. I remind the kids this cartoon world is unreal, that seldom can we mend what we have crushed or sliced into pieces. They look at me as if I'm nuts, or the kid in kindergarten who wet his pants the first day of class. They're sure of their universe and that it bears no resemblance to mine. It's just a cartoon. No one hits the cat. They roll their eyes in disbelief. I get a lot of that these days. Our cat rolls a stretch and leaps on the couch, landing delicately and with such grace, we should watch her magic all day. That orchestra of neurons, that song and sway on the prowl. And I don't even like the cat. So I'm left wondering, oh, wait, now that's funny. The canary just chainsawed Sylvester across the belt line. His torso floats as he grabs his lower body like a pair of trousers until he grabs a staple gun and tacks himself together. He seems so real to me, this black cat, always losing, dismembered and reassembled, only to face a stick of short-fused dynamite or swallow a nest of angry hornets. Now a horde of bees explodes from a shotgun and peppers his rear. I start again to object. There's something important I want to say. But the kids shut me down and reach for more popcorn. And then we all laugh as the cat gets driven like a fence post into clay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Don't, don't cats always get the bad end of the deal in the, in the cartoons? Yeah. I always love the humor in your work, John. It's, uh, and, and it's quirky and it's engaging and it's, you know, you're wonderful with visuals and character. Just love it. That's because of all the wine we have here. <laughs> Dee, do you want to jump in for a final thing here? We are kind of getting on toward eight. I mean, uh, you know, certainly anybody who wants to stay after and talk to any of the writers is welcome to. Well, where I'm at, it's just barely seven. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll read a couple more. Um, speaking okay, of great. wine, almost every one of the classical Chinese poets talks about 
hoping to have wine. Uh, where is the wine? Uh, can I have another wine? And I, I wonder what it must have been. Must have been a Chablis or something. I don't think this one has uh, any wine in it. After a spring evening of baked cod, green beans and cold wine, oh, I relax with autumn evening beside the lake by the poetess Li Ting Chao. Each day, the lake is warmer and warmer. Each day, more and more bathe on the beach. Each day, boats arrive from dry dock. This weekend, the beach house opens. White sails already billow in the harbor. Winter is boxed away until Labor Day. In a few days, millions of girls will vote for an American Idol. Older folks will have a new star on Dancing with the Stars. Park painters have started to paint the swimming pools. The Forsythia has six yellow blooms. River crews are cleaning the river trails. The seagulls provide aerial complaints. A body has popped up where ice fishermen once sat all day. Another fell on last night, tipsy. Young men and women, muscle, are starting to crew down the river. And one last one. After a long run along the lakefront, I try to nap with Lu Yu's Phoenix hairpins. For days, our kitchen blooms with yellow daylilies. Wine glasses hang for more cold wine. I guess there are a lot of wine poems in this class. Outside, all over the city, chrysanthemums are starting to open. Above us, clouds turn dark blue into thunderstorms. Soon, the mailman will come carrying more rejections once again. I sometimes wonder if I ever find what others already see. What does it matter if everyone chatters on about what they've just done to keep pain from drifting back in all over again? Clothes no longer fit the featherweight I've slumped into, but the yellow daylilies have opened in our village soothing what I can't do myself. I'd like to be here when there's no more time to let this ink seep into something that you might want as something precious forever. Wonderful. Very nice, Dee, thank you. Very yeah. beautiful. Deirdre, do you wanna finish with a last short poem? Do you have one that Maybe a goodbye poem or a, a wine poem? <laughs> <laughs> a wine poem. Um, or a goodbye wine poem? I don't think I have any wine poems, but now I feel like I need a collection. Um, there you go. I can. This, this is the I first one I did. Sorry. I guess um, this is from my poetry collection, Have Love. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll offer this because of its imagery. It's titled Rose Colored Lovers. I eyed what I thought was a tomato on a rose bush and reflected, which is more succulent? One makes lovers, the other sates, but which nourishes? I would like to live on roses, each petal's dew cascading over my tongue as guileless as a cherry tomato's. Skin punctured tenderly, penetration barely delectable. A short one. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you all of our writers tonight. Uh, really appreciate you sharing your work and uh, thank you all for uh, joining us uh, to uh, listen to our writers. And I just want to remind you that next week, at the same time, uh, we'll have uh, Betty Stellaric reading from her uh, newest novel. And that will not be a Zoom. That's going to be a recording. And all of the books uh, that uh, our writers have read from tonight are available in the Painted Turtle Bookshop in artwork. So please feel free to come in and buy one or two or three. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thanks for being with you all the way from Milwaukee.
Wonderful to see you, Dee. Great to see you, Dee. Yeah, well,